Well, hello YouTubers and welcome back to the Holtz Mitchell channel on another episode of Riding the Fence. Uh, today we're going to be tearing down a Weinig U, uh, let's see, U140-4. Now the U for universal. Uh, the 140 is the maximum spindle width or cutter width that you can employ on this uh, on the horizontal uh, spindles on this machine and slash four for four heads. <clears throat> now this machine was built in 1972 and this predates or I should say um, um, there have been chromed beds before. I don't know about whining when they started uh, hard chrome, hard, you know, hard plating the uh, the beds of their or their machines. I'm sure they've done it prior to that, but uh, this machine anyway has just a strictly cast iron, uh, you know, running surface on the bed of the machine, and what has happened over the years now. MDF is is kind of an interesting. Uh, material in that it it's not really abrasive but yet it is um, it acts kind of like a, a lapping stone or a lapping uh, disc so to speak and from pro prolonged use you get grooves worn in the bed of the machine now if you run a lot of wood you of course you get the same thing but uh, you wind up running a lot more uh, lineal footage of wood through a machine like this than you do MDF. So anyway, this machine primarily processes thin MDF material. And of course the, uh, the, the surface of the, the MDF is quite hard. And where you get the cut going, um, or you know the, where the material's been cut, you'll get a little raised burr, so to speak. Um, it is actually a burr and uh, that burr again is abrasive enough to where it'll actually wear a groove in the bed and that's what's happened here. Now this machine has also been outfitted with the uh, feed in feed table to have a groove that will accommodate uh, at least um, one side of that that burr. So. The other side didn't, but that didn't really matter as much. Now, again, this is an old machine. It's been running since 1972. Seen a lot of a lot of material go through it, and so it's time for an overhaul. So, anyway, here's the machine uh, just prior to the teardown. Okay, now we can't show you the, the, the finished thing. It's still a work in progress. Got uh, a few other items, a, part, a few parts for this machine to make yet. Um, one is the, uh, the mount for the hold down shoe uh, for, the, for the horizontal spindle. And uh, that part's up on the on the mill right here right now, um, but uh, here's how we're going to um, treat the surface of the of the running the plates uh, that that comprise the the bed of the machine. Now um, we don't have a surface grinder that we can use uh, to grind these with, unfortunately. Um, so I ended up putting the fly cutter on the mill. I made a set of, um, oh, 
uh, hold down, so to speak. These are actually bridge posts, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, to support the uh, two plates that have that, that accommodate the spindle. Yeah. use these to um, uh, fly cut the other plates because then I could put in a couple of holes to where the bolts and the studs that uh, that actually hold the, the the plates to the to the uh, machine itself would actually mount up so here's uh, a few uh, short clips of some of the parts being uh, plane down with a fly cutter.
Now, <clears throat> I'm going to turn the camera here in a shortly and, and get a little uh, perspective on the whiteboard. Now, as you can see, there's, you know, the, the, the finish on the, on the thing looks pretty good. Um, it is fairly smooth, but again, it's a fly cutter. And rather than be able to run a, a dished cutter, especially on the infeed table because it had the fence attached to it, and so I wasn't able to allow the cutter to go past the edge of the table uh, and over it, um, I had to go right up to it. In one case, I actually kind of nicked the uh, fence with, uh, with the edge of the cutter and um, it wound up putting a little streak in there. Of course, the, the fence had to be um, resurfaced as well because it was all worn in and, and cattywampus. So um, the cut in the middle of it, now as you go, you know, as, you look, as you're looking down on the cut, you'll see a nice circular pattern. And then as the cutter comes around, you get more and more overlap as it approaches the tangent along the, the cutting edge. You'll get a smoother finish on the sides compared to the center of the cut. And so uh, what you got then is, um, well, let me uh, put that up here on the, uh, on the whiteboard and I'll kind of show you. Now if you're looking at the, at the surface, at the cross section, you'll get sort of like a saw effect, especially in the apex of the, uh, of the cut because your knife, you know, is, is kind of like this shape. Oops. And so as it passes, it leaves, you know, a groove. Now, the problem is, if you were to just start running um, MDF over it again, what you wind up doing is you're knocking off, oops, this doesn't really want to come off all that well. You start knocking off the tips of your of your cut material and then you wear, wear a groove in it you get accelerated wear in this case so uh, this is why grinding was was actually would have been more preferential and better for the whole project but like I said unfortunately we don't have a grinder at our disposal uh, to be able to take care of this in a you know in this fashion so what I wound up doing, um, let me turn the camera around here. So what I ended up doing is, is making a few 
uh, lapping plates. Now, I have to, at this point, uh, say a big thank you to Tom Lipton. Uh, hope you're watching this, Tom, uh, to give the inspiration for uh, these lapping plates. Um, Tom recently, or well, it's been quite a while back, uh, made a, a set of lapping plates, and so I took that same idea and ran with it and uh, made a set of lapping plates for this. Now, the other thing is um, I didn't use diamond on this. One, uh, wasn't really all that necessary. Uh, we just needed to get the the biggest height differential, uh, the differential in, in height knocked down uh, to where you get a semi-smooth finish. It didn't have to be perfectly smooth, but it had to be smooth enough to where the MDF won't rub uh, a new, uh, you know, furrow into, into the into the table. And so, what I used is uh, valve grinding compound, and this is this stuff right here. Now this is a, a compound by Di Diam Diamant or Diamond. Um, it's I'm not sure what uh, the substance is inside this stuff. Um, it, you got a number one and a number three. I bought it as a kit online, and uh, it's suitable for cast iron as well. So that's the reason I got into it. Other than that, uh, I probably would have went with a diamond paste, but there again. Uh, cost versus uh, you know need uh, is, is one of those things where you just kind of had to go mm, okay so I ended up opting for the uh, um, for the valve lapping compound and use that for for this project and it worked and it wound up working out well now as you can see here's the lapping plates being made. First here's the, the this chunk being cut on the saw. Now, as you can see that's quite the honker. Um, takes three men and a boy to lift that pig up. We wound up getting the engine hoist over here and lifting it onto the saw and then uh, we're able to cut most of the way through it, but then there was a little thread on the back side, or at the bottom I should say, that uh, end up taking the, the grinder and just cutting off that little lip that was left. And so now here's the thing actually on the, on the mill here being made. Now, what I wound up doing is I made two discs. Um, sure, uh, I mean, Tom Lipton made a set of three, and I do intend to make a set of three uh, for myself out of this same chunk, but uh, that's for a later project, and you know, uh, I can spare you the agony of having to sit through the, the hours and hours and hours of watching this thing go and working, so I'm just gonna give you a few little excerpts. Uh, in the video. Um, I wasn't quite sure what kind of spacing to give uh, the grooves on this thing so I wound up the first disc I wound up making um, I went with a five millimeter spacing with a two millimeter um, uh, rate or it's got a millimeter radius uh, a little radius cutter and so I went a millimeter deep, and then again, five millimeters on center, which gave a three and a half millimeter square on the cutting surface of the disc. The second disc, I wound up going seven uh, millimeters to give it a five millimeter, which is 200 thousandths uh, spacing on the, on the discs. Now, I should have just gone with the three and a half millimeter, or the five millimeter spacing on both of them. And for this reason, is that you have more teeth and you have, um, well, a little bit better engagement. Uh, the smaller teeth actually cut much better on the surface of the cast iron. 
Um, it was able to remove the material a lot faster with either grit. Um, I used the, the larger uh, space disc first with the coarser uh, with the coarser grit just in order just to knock down the you know the high bumps and the high spots. Um, as it turns out, I probably would I should have just gone with uh, uh, let me get situated here. Should have gone with uh, with the other disc, Mox Nix. But anyway, I, I flattened them both um, on each other, and so anyway, the the finer you know the the finer tooth disc actually cut better, abraded more material, was able to circulate the uh, the abrasive a lot better. And this is abrasive is also um, oil soluble, and so I wound up using a light oil, in this case WD-40. You can use diesel, you can use gasoline, kerosene, um, whatever you have at hand. Uh, you can even use heating oil, whatever you got, uh, to dilute this stuff and, and use it as a uh, floating medium for, for that matter, for lack of a better term. Now in modern machines, they hard chrome or chrome plate these, uh, these bed plates and that significantly reduces the wear. Now that you don't have that advantage in cast iron, um, if you have a ground surface, of course, that is a little more resistant to wear because the, the porosity of the, of the, the, um, the machine, uh, machine surface is a lot uh, finer than it is with just a fly cut. So.
And lo and behold, ta-da! No more toolage markage. Even with the lapping, there's still the issue of, of course, with wear. Um, if we look at the uh, surface, you know, there's there's still those those tool marks in there. Now, we took out most of the tool marks as much as we could, and I want to say at this point too that um, with the tool marks, I didn't want to take down uh, the. Uh, or, or lap it to the point where the material is completely smooth because then you don't know um, you don't have any control over um, what I'm looking for the the end measurement you then you're going to have to start measuring cleaning measuring clean measure clean measure and that winds up being a real no, a real pain in the ass and, and uh, it's, so it's kind of hard to follow along. So what I did is I just uh, was able to wipe my finger across the surface that was being lapped and I could see how much of the tool marks were being removed and then I could gauge it on account of that where, where I needed to stop. Now the other thing is too with the finer uh, lapping compound, um, you don't get to see this in the in the video unfortunately but or hear it all that much you can hear it grinding and then as it starts to smooth out you can you can actually feel it um, the disc becomes a little easier to move across the surface and then also you feel it in the, in the in your fingertips uh, the vibration becomes a little less and it, it gets a lot smoother as the surface gets smoother and the abrasive wears down and breaks down in, in the cut um, you get uh, you know you, you can feel your finish getting finer and then of course you just take your finger wipe across there and that's how you can kind of gauge when to stop <clears throat> now also uh, what I did is I used the figure eight um, you kind of see it right here. Now, um, also what I was doing at the same time, I was slightly rotating the disc with each pass, so to speak. When I'd come up on one point, I'd just rotate it slightly and then sometimes also mid-stroke I'd rotate it ever so slightly. You don't have to give it a, you know, a full rotation, just a little bit, you know, just to kind of rotate the, the cutting teeth a little bit on the surface so that your abrasive is getting pulled back up underneath the surface of the, uh, the, of the square doing the cutting. So that was, that's imperative that you keep doing that. Otherwise, um, as Tom points out in his video, um, you wind up getting, the, you know, um, a little lopsided um, cut. So anyway, it's important that you rotate the disc. Um, you know, as you're as you're um, as you're polishing. So. Now the final step in this is sealing the bed with wax and of course it sounds a little abstract um, in the groove of bed whining uh, the video um, is in the lineup I'll put the link in the description below um, this machine was using a beeswax based uh, lubricant to lubricate the bed and it too had an all cast uh, running bed and so what I wound up doing here is first I'd rub down the the surface of the the, the, the machine surface of the polished surface clean it up real good just with WD-40 like right here
Then what I would do is I took a piece of candle wax, and this is a, just an old candle, pulled the, um, the, um, the wick out of it, and it also had a little bit harder surface. Or the, the outer shell was a little harder, so I wound up cutting that off and then uh, taking it and just rub it down, give it a good initial rub, and then uh, like right here. And then I would take the cutting torch and heat it up. Now, uh, the cutting torch is a little extreme. I don't recommend doing this. The only reason I did it is because I don't have a blow dryer uh, to do this with or a heat gun. Uh, I, I would highly recommend using a heat gun. That way you can give your part the heat gradually uh, and you have a lot less risk of, of a fire. Uh, you know, I'm using paper towels to wipe the thing down and then, uh, of course, I caught a few of them on fire just you know, it's kind of the way it goes. Um, but anyway, um, here's how I warmed up the, uh, the part and then allowed the, the wax. Now the wax will act as a, a floating agent for the remainder of the abrasive that's still down left in the grooves. You can't really get it out. Um, you, try as you may with whatever cleaners and, you know, uh, sol uh, solvents that you might apply to it. You, there's always still going to be a certain amount, but the wax actually floated this stuff right up out. And so you don't really see it too well in the video, but here's a, a, a clip on how that, you know, the, the wax was applied. So at the end of the heating cycle, 
um, the part will maintain enough heat where the, the wax will stay fluid for a while or at least uh, in a state of, of or liquid state long enough to where you can actually go back and, and wipe it down. So you want to you want to wipe it down, wipe off all the the, the goop, the especially that that abrasive that's still in there. Wipe that all down. Give it a fresh coat with uh, a clean or with clean surface of the wax that you're using, and then wipe it down again and rub it in real good. So that way. Um, you have a little bit of a lubricant in the pores that actually helps uh, suspend the wood on the surface of the, of the machine. Now, the other thing that I was, I was going to mention too on the wax, as you apply it, you'll see a little bit of an edge or, you know, the black goop build up on the edge of the wax. Peel that off. You don't want that going back into your fresh, uh, in your, in your fresh wax application um, every time, you, you know, you're, you're applying wax. So you got to make sure that your wax stays fairly clean uh, as you apply it and then you know, like I said, wipe it down real good with a, with a cloth. Um, in this case, I just use these paper shop towels. They work just fine. Um, personally, I would recommend an old t-shirt for this kind of a job uh, because it is absorbent and it will absorb the abrasive, uh, you know, with the wax and prevent it from going back in. And then you can just kind of wad it up and really buff it up and polish it up good. But anyway, here's a, a picture of the finished parts. So now the next step is, of course, to make uh, the other parts that are, that are needed to complete this project, the ones that were broken, and uh, finish working up the other ones that uh, still need uh, some attention. But we'll save that for the next episode, and then, of course, the reassembly of the whole machine. So, well, YouTubers, that's a wrap for this episode of Riding the Fence. I hope you were able to get a little something out of this. Uh, some of you may have noticed that the channel has been monetized recently. Um, I, res I wrestled with that question whether or not to, uh, to monetize the channel for a long, long time. Um, I didn't really want to have to, but I have some goals for the future that I have to somehow accomplish. And on the wages that I'm getting here, it's just going to be a little bit tough to do. Um, I'm not making any sales for some of the, you know, little trinkets that I do make on the side. So I was kind of hoping that uh, for those of you watching, if you click on an ad every once in a while, that revenue helps fund what's going on here. And um, any help would be greatly appreciated. Uh, the one way you can look at it, it's no money out of your pocket. Uh, it's a little bit of a pain in the ass to have to sit through an ad or just, you know, kind of ignore it or whatever. But it does help me immensely. Um, right now, I'm up to, I don't know, five bucks, six bucks, whatever it is, uh, since I monetized the channel. So I would appreciate it if uh, folks were, you know, if, if you help out a little bit and allow the ad to run or, you know, click on an ad every once in a while, you don't have to do it all the time, but just keep in mind, it's no money out of your pocket. It's just a little, you know, little time that you might have to sit through an ad. But with that, if you have any thoughts, comments, suggestions, and critiques, by all means, put them in the comment section below. Every little bit of um, traffic that the channel gets or a video gets, it bumps it up in the ratings and it it moves it up in, in YouTube's um, 
uh, algorithm for suggested in the suggested feed for subjects that people are watching for. So uh, the one video I have on on wood drying is extremely popular. That thing gets lots of views. It's still pulling in. Uh, I don't know what it's up to. It's over 40,000 views, and uh, it's still pulling in, you know, quite a f few hundred a month, which is surprising to me. Um, and so it's generating a little bit of ad revenue, and uh, I do do appreciate it. So, but uh, anyway, the the comment section in there is really, you know, it's longer than an arm sleeve, and. Uh, that's part of what helps that video move up in the suggested in the in the ratings so if you have a, a thought in your head if you have a question by all means put that in the comment section let's bump up the traffic and let's see if we can't get this channel moving up a little bit into, into the more popular range uh, I don't ever foresee being as popular as Tom Lipton with Ox Tool or Keith Rucker but you never know it might happen so with that, thanks for stopping by, and every little bit that you can contribute in one way or another is certainly appreciated, and we'll hope to see you all again very soon.